Hello my dears and welcome to another video. I'm so glad to have you. I planned for all of my October videos to be kind of spooky related and then the one in the slot had to be postponed due to research reasons. Um, more that research is ongoing and I need it to get a little farther before I talk about it. Anyway, um, I decided to talk about Helen Keller because she's a weirdly common Halloween costume and really should not be and so it like sort of ties in. Either way, even if it's not super thematically appropriate, she is uh, super interesting so it's gonna be a good time. Anyway, also for friends who need it, I am a white young person with light brown shoulder length curly hair. I'm wearing a uh, red button-up shirt with squirrels on it and a uh, black sleeveless dress on top of that and I'm sitting in front of a plain wall that has green leaves on it. Now when we think about Helen Keller everybody kind of thinks of the same image. A seven-year-old girl at a water pump learning the word for water for the first time. If you have any other images in your brain it's usually of like this quiet, seemingly docile older woman smiling at some press event. And you might have a little bit more of the like recent discussions around Helen Keller being a eugenicist, maybe some of the conspiracy theories lately about how she's not real or whatever that have been occasionally popping up on TikTok, but that's kind of it. That's all that you have in your brain, which is unfortunate given the fact that she wrote 14 books and over 475 speeches and was the first deaf blind person to graduate from college and also was on an FBI watch list for most of her life. Also the eugenics thing, we're gonna talk about that later. I also want to give a specific source shout out because this was like my primary source and then I pulled a lot of other stuff after the fact um, for the PBS American Masters documentary, I believe it's called Becoming Helen Keller, something to that degree. Um, it is an incredible breakdown of her life and her legacy and everything. It's really, really well made um, and centers deafblind voices. PBS really knows what they're doing when it comes to disability documentaries the majority of the time. Um, so if you can get your hands on it, I highly recommend it. It's a fantastically made film, but also thank you to that source for being my primary uh, organization for how this video turned out. Anyway, so who was Helen Keller? She was born on June 27th, 1880 in Tuscumbia, Alabama, and her father was a former Confederate soldier and they lived on a plantation called Ivy Green that until the 13th Amendment had been run by slave labor. After the war, her father was an editor for an Alabama newspaper. Helen was his first daughter, but she had two older brothers and two siblings born after her. So it was a very full household. And when she was 19 months old, she fell ill with what was very likely bacterial meningitis, which caused her to lose her ability to see and hear. And we're gonna talk about the uh, miracle worker play and film later in this video, but if you're familiar with that at all, you kind of picture the next five or so years of Helen's life as like, utter chaos with her completely detached from any and all things and confused constantly and having no way to communicate. But in reality, Helen created many home signs, which basically is a sign system that somebody creates to communicate within their inner circle when they don't have access to formal sign language or any other uh, form of language to communicate. So she had signs for mom and dad and her aunt for come here, for go away, even for ice cream. She had over 60 signs. She also had a friend who sort of doubled as a babysitter whose name was Martha Washington and was the daughter of their cook. And Helen wrote later in life about how she found joy in domineering over Martha and making her do things and obviously there would always be some semblance of a power dynamic there given uh, both the race and class situation but at the very least this points to the fact that she was actively connecting with and interacting with people during this time of her life. Helen's mother didn't want to institutionalize her but she wasn't quite sure what to do about her until she read Charles Dickens' American Notes for General Circulation which is a travelogue from his 1842 trip to North America and in it he talked about a girl that he met named Laura Bridgman who was deaf blind and had been taught how to read and write. Hopeful, the family asked a physician for advice who then connected them to Alexander Graham Bell, we'll talk about him later, who suggested that they reach out to the Perkins School for the Blind. So they sent a letter to the head of the school asking if there's anybody who would be able to teach Helen, and they sent Anne Sullivan. Anne had been educated at Perkins herself. She had contracted trachoma when she was a child, which caused her to become nearly blind. And then after her mother died, she became a ward of the state and lived in an almshouse, which is functionally an institution for many years. And then at age 14 was sent to Perkins where she learned to read and write and also had some eye operations that helped restore some of her vision. She graduated valedictorian from her class and was friends with Laura Bridgman. She was 20 years old when she was sent to Alabama to work with a nearly seven year old Helen. And even though her struggles with her eyes are sort of in the miracle worker to some degree, everybody kind of just forgets the fact that Anne was disabled herself, which I think is really important because the two of them very much accommodate each other and support each other with their different needs over the years. Now when Anne arrived, she was not super thrilled with the behavior that Helen was able to get away with, nor with the uh, politics of Helen's family, but she and the girl connected really well. And she ended up doing a sort of intervention which had to be slightly physical because Helen did not have language beyond the 60 or so home signs that she used with her family and therefore had a lot of reason to be frustrated and very little way to properly express that fact. Anne began by fingerspelling words into Helen's hands constantly so she would start to pick it up organically and Helen began to imitate what Anne was doing which is basically the ASL equivalent of babbling since she was not quite sure what she was doing but knew that this was some method of communication. And then one day she was feeling Anne spell water 
and she was feeling water at the same time and everything in her brain just kind of clicked together. And she then began learning words for things at super speed and wanted to use language to describe absolutely everything. And then used books with raised print to teach her how to read and used a lettering system called square hand to teach her how to write. Braille did exist in this era, but it was not standardized until 1932. So blind and deafblind people used very different systems in order to read across the country. So if I understand correctly, she used uh, raised letters at this point in her, in her life, but she later learned all of the different systems. Uh, that's a fairly unimportant side note, but I thought it was interesting. Anyway, so Anne was writing back to Michael Anagnos, the head of school at Perkins at the time, to tell him all about Helen's progress. And Anagnos saw this as a really great way to advertise that the graduates of the school are able to do really cool things. So he sent out the story to alumni, which then ended up getting wider press and Sullivan was not the hugest fan of this. She felt like the narrative was going to be somewhat co-opted and used in unsavory ways. She was right. Um, at age eight, after a year of working with Sullivan, the two of them went off to officially enroll her as a student at Perkins, where she very quickly excelled. She was also taught to lip read using her hands, to which she quickly requested, can you teach me how to talk with my mouth also? So she was then reconnected with Alexander Graham Bell, who was a guy. Uh, you may know him as the dude who invented the telephone. He was also an educator of the deaf and supposedly a very beautiful signer. Um, both his wife and his mother were deaf, but he wanted nothing more than to help deaf people assimilate into the hearing world. He published research, putting that in air quotes, called Memoir Upon the Formation of a Deaf Variety of the Human Race, about how deaf people marrying other deaf people would be a catastrophe and create an entire deaf population. Um, he fudged the majority of that research, and also that's not statistically possible, um, or genetically possible. Um, and also, even if it were, that wouldn't be the end of the world. Anyway, he also founded the American Association to Promoting the Teaching of Speech to the Deaf, which is now called the Alexander Graham Bell Association for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing, which actively supports oralism, which is an education movement that wanted all sign language removed from schools and only allowed deaf students to speak and lip read, which unfortunately became the official educational guidance for deaf schools in the United States in 1880 and lasted for a disgustingly long time. Um, he was also the honorary president of the Second International Congress of Eugenics. And generally in the deaf realm, if you see Alexander Graham Bell's name and anything, run in the opposite direction. I do think it's important to acknowledge that in this era, eugenics was seen as the progressive science and it was taught at most colleges and universities, as well as the fact that it was the widespread idea that the best way to help disabled people is to give them the tools to assimilate into the world. And that doesn't necessarily make any of this any less sad, bad, or ableist or harmful. Um, and the whole like, it was a different time argument generally bothers me. But I also think even today there is a tricky line of balancing between we need to give people the tools to be able to navigate the world in which we live and the world needs to be more accessible to different kinds of people because we shouldn't force people to, you know, hide who they are in order to survive, right? And that conversation isn't super incredibly different from the conversations around that which they were having back then. We just go about it today a lot differently and we more heavily center disabled people in that conversation most of the time, and we're a little bit less paternalistic about it now, most of the time, but I really don't think it's that different. So my feelings on this within this historical context are quite complicated, but the bigger red flag to me is the fact that the Alexander Graham Bell Association really has not changed their position much since the early 1900s, despite us having significantly more research and knowledge about the mechanisms of learning and education and ableism. But we're gonna talk more about eugenics and imperfect historical figures later. Now, Helen and Bell became very close friends with him being a sort of mentor for her for much of her life. And he was involved in teaching her speech and verbal communication. As more and more people learned about Helen and her progress, the public discussions that happened around Laura Bridgman that accused her of just being a trained mimic rather than capable of actually learning and thinking resurfaced around Helen. Her entire life there were people accusing her of faking it and being nothing more than a publicity stunt show pony. And I simply cannot imagine the toll that that would have on anybody, especially a child. Like the amount of pressure that she must have just had on her shoulders at such a young age is so sad to me. But anyway, when she was 11, she wrote a story and she sent it to Anagnos as a present. And he publishes it because the ability to create an original story would prove those people wrong and show that she was in fact real and capable of learning. Um, really unclear to me whether he asked her permission to publish that or not. I personally feel kind of weird about her private gift to him being used effectively as a political pawn. Anywho, when it was printed in a deaf community newspaper, readers noticed that it was eerily similar to a story that already existed titled The Frost Fairies by Margaret Canby. The story did not exist in raised print at the time. It was also not in the Perkins Library. So there was no way that she could have read it independently. Um, so Anagnos launched an investigation since this was a very public scandal of his own doing. I really don't pity this man. And he separated her from Anne to interrogate her. And her parents said they'd never heard of the story and Anne said she'd never read it to Helen. And an overall verdict was never really made. But Anagnos firmly believed that Sullivan 
had read it to Helen and was covering it up and privately referred to Helen as a living lie for the rest of his life while publicly continuing to support her probably for political reasons. This experience obviously deeply traumatized Helen and she began to struggle with anxiety around writing, getting nervous to even write a letter to her mother for fear that she might accidentally unknowingly plagiarize it. After this incident, she did not return to Perkins and Anne suggested that she work through this anxiety around writing by writing about her individual experiences. When she was 12 years old, one of those essays was published and Mark Twain read it and he wrote about what an incredible writer she was, which gained her even more popularity. At age 16, she decided she wanted to go to college. They suggested Wellesley or Vassar as options, but she insisted on Harvard. And Harvard would not become co-ed until the 1940s, but they did have an associated women's college called Radcliffe, one of the two Seven Sisters that is no longer a Seven Sister. May Radcliffe rest in peace. Um, but she took her examinations and she was accepted. She had interpreters and her friends helped her to take notes. She also took notes herself. And whenever she took tests, they had two separate impartial proctors present to make sure that things were fair for her. There was a huge debate in this era about whether women should actually be able to go to college or not, like whether they could handle it, whether it would affect their ability to have children, whether it was ethical for them to even go to college. And then we have Helen Keller showing up as a student at a women's college, which then became a huge part of that argument. And you will see over time, this poor woman is constantly dragged into random arguments with without her own consent. Anyway, um, many people did not think that she was actually completing her coursework and whatnot. They didn't trust it. So the dean kept all of her exams and grades in his office to be available for inspection if anybody wanted to see them, which happened more often than you would think. While she was at Radcliffe, she got a lot more into politics and she also became more of a writer and Ladies Home Journal offered to publish some of her memoir essays. And she and Anne were so overwhelmed by all of them that they hired Professor John Albert Macy to help them organize and edit what would become her book, The Story of My Life, which was published in 1903. If you ever hear people talking about Helen Keller's book. This is usually the one that they're referring to. It is the most famous of all of her books. In 1904, she graduated with honors and then she began writing for a local socialist newspaper, an icon, with much of her writing focusing on the lack of job opportunities available for the blind and otherwise disabled people. She also published another memoir and during this time, John and Anne fell in love with each other and they got married and then the three of them moved in together. In 1906, Helen Keller became one of the first commissioners for the Massachusetts Commission for the Blind, which worked to advance the civil rights of blind people. One of her first projects with them and with what was at the time the Massachusetts Association for Promoting the Interests of the Adult Blind, now the Massachusetts Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired. If I understand correctly, these were and are two separate things in slightly different directions, but they have a lot of overlap and had a lot of the same original uh, people in each one. Let's well, talk about how the majority of blindness in babies at the time was caused by untreated congenital venereal diseases and create a legislation to require treatments for that to be available to newborns in order to prevent this. I was not able to find specific numbers as to what impact this had. But one article that I read mentioned that this type of blindness was the case for about 28% of students enrolled in schools for the blind in the early 1900s, and by the 1950s it was down to 0.1%. And not only is this a huge deal in taking care of preventable blindness, but it also started important conversations around venereal diseases um, and birth control, which were simply not even remotely talked about back then. While working on this board, everything was provided in braille for her and the other blind and low vision members of the commission, but she had to provide her own interpreters and no other efforts were made to make things more accessible to her, which she found exhausting and felt like she couldn't participate participate fully, and so she decided to resign. In 1911, she had surgery to remove both of her eyes and have them replaced with glass eyes. It's not entirely clear why this choice was made, but up until this point, she had a slightly protruding left eye and was always deliberately photographed in such a way as to hide it, so this may have been a decision for somewhat cosmetic reasons. Some scholars have suggested that this was a deliberate choice to make sure that she looked more palatable, for lack of a better word, to be able to be more effective as an activist and as an advocate. And speaking of which, let's talk about Helen Keller's politics. Um, so Helen had a lot of opinions about the state of things and what should be done about them, and she also knew that wherever she went, the press was going to follow. So she made really great use of that. She joined a labor union saying that the leading cause of disability is corporate greed and a refusal to guarantee the safety of workers. She was a suffragist saying that being female was more of a disability than being deafblind because they did not have the right to use their voices and vote. She she donated a large sum of money to the NAACP along with an open letter about how racism and particularly lynchings are really terrible, even while her parents and local people from her hometown very much told her to please back off on this. She also gave anti-war speeches before the First World War. She was a member of the Socialist Party and thus began being monitored by the FBI who feared she might become a communist. And um, she was regularly seen at all kinds of protests all the time. Um, my favorite story being that in 1919, a silent film about her life was released called Deliverance, and it's really weird. And the actors were on strike at the time the film was released. So she 
skipped her own premiere and picketed her own film along with all the other actors. She also co-founded the American Civil Liberties Union in 1920, and while she and Anne had always struggled with money, when Andrew Carnegie offered to pay her a large pension, she firmly declined. Throughout all of this time, Anne and John were constantly blamed for brainwashing Helen into having these political opinions or like using her to further their own agenda, when obviously that was not the case, but it was constantly used to discredit her. Another very common argument was, if somebody as defective as Helen Keller can hold these beliefs, that just proves how wrong those beliefs are, which also obviously deeply ableist in a very different direction. But as time went on, Anne's eyesight began to get worse again, and she was sick often. And one night she fell in a hotel when it was just her and Helen, and that was when they decided to hire somebody else to join their little group and take on some of the workload, who ended up being a Scottish woman named Polly Thompson in 1914. That same year, John and Anne's marriage fell apart, and he left, causing Anne to struggle with a lot of grief and what we would probably call depression today. Two years later, when Polly went home to Scotland for a vacation for some time, they hired a friend of John's, a man named Peter Fagan, to take over her duties for that short time. He and Helen ended up falling madly in love with each other, and they decided to marry, but they ended up keeping it a secret for some time for fear of everybody else reacting terribly. Their plan was to tell Sullivan first, assuming she would approve, and then work from there. But instead, the press found out that they'd applied for a marriage license and started writing about it. So the entire family found out via newspapers and came to bang down their door and demand to know what was going on. Helen panicked, not wanting to hurt Peter any further, so she ended up denying everything. Her mother kicked Peter out and took Helen to Alabama, and when he tried to visit her, they chased him off with a shotgun, and they regretfully separated. She writes about this time as if it were, like, a passing fancy, a silly thing that she never really should have done, but in a way that, like, makes you as the reader feel like if Helen had had the support on this choice, she probably would have stayed married to him, but she's trying to pretend that she's cool with how everything turned out because she doesn't believe she deserves to really have a relationship like that, which is just really, really sad. Um, but once again, struggling with money, especially after their 1919 film did not do very well at the box office, Helen and Anne decided to take a contract as a vaudeville act, which is something that they turned down um, when she was a lot younger. But Helen absolutely loved it. She found it very thrilling. She loved the energy of the crowds, loved the level of reach she was able to get. It paid better than anything else she'd ever done. And she found many of the questions that she was asked during the Q&A portions of their set to be quite funny, and she would respond in very clever and sassy ways. I would also imagine that the social environment of performing in a vaudeville show for an audience coming in to expect that kind of thing would be a very different experience from going to be a formal academic speaker in a way that is uh, more energizing and exciting. Like, even for me, I love giving academic talks, I love doing those kinds of workshops, but theater will always infinitely be more fun and feel much lighter and more like an adventure and more adrenaline, so I completely understand where she's coming with that. But after a few years, as Anne's health continued to decline, they had to quit performing, and Helen's next job would be the one she's most known for because she would do it for over 40 years. She was hired by the American Foundation for the Blind as a sort of spokesperson, and with them she campaigned for sight-saving classes in public schools, access to braille and audio options, accessible resources for job training, and helped establish commissions for the blind in nearly 20 states. She also convinced President Herbert Hoover to host an International Assembly of Blind Leaders at the White House in the early 1930s, which coincided with the agreement to standardize Braille across the board and use it in all schools for the blind in the U.S. The issue with this job, however, is that they asked her to not speak about socialism or many of her other, uh, stronger political opinions that she used to share so openly and widely. They also had speechwriters write what she was going to say on her speaking tours, which were usually something along the lines of like, the poor blind people are living in darkness, but with your support, they may have some hope for a better future. And she did push back with her opinions where possible, most notably being frustrated about the emphasis on funds for talking books when she thought there were larger concerns at play, given that it was the middle of the Great Depression and that money should probably be used elsewhere. She was also very outspoken against Nazi Germany well before the war began. Also her German, uh, a publisher told her that she needed to heavily censor her books for publication in Germany, and she declined, and her books were often very, very publicly burned um, in the book burnings. I also do just want to say, um, in the section of the documentary, the PBS documentary I talked about earlier, uh, where they talk about this, and they show footage of book burnings, they're showing the footage of the uh, burning of all of the documents about trans uh, history and science that uh, existed at the time, which we've talked about before, and I'll link that video above, but that was an interesting uh, overlap that I was like, hey, I recognize that footage, and that's not from what they think it is, but I thought that that was um, interesting. Anyway, in 1936, Anne Sullivan died, and she became the first woman to have her ashes placed in the National Cathedral. As Anne's health was failing, everybody was very, very worried about what would happen to Helen once Anne passed, because they'd been together for, like, forever. Um, but she and Polly traveled to Scotland to grieve, and Helen wrote another book while she was there. After the war ended, she went to Japan as a goodwill ambassador to spread away around the struggles of blind people in Japan, and it became very clear that she was really, really, really good at being an ambassador, and also she quite enjoyed it. Yes, people saw her as an American, but they also saw her as something a lot 
larger and more symbolic than that. And also she was quite persuasive at getting things done. So over the course of her life, she would travel to 39 different countries to try to convince foreign leaders to establish schools for the blind and deaf, and also do a lot of other work to uplift various marginalized groups. Speaking of which, when she and Polly moved to Connecticut, they befriended Broadway star Catherine Cornell and her partner Nancy Hamilton. Cornell was in a lavender marriage at the time. Um, and Cornell and Hamilton made a documentary about Helen and her daily life in 1954. I think that's fun. I love that they were neighbors and best friends with lesbians. Anyway, a few years later, um, The Miracle Worker was written first staged in 1959 at the Playhouse Theatre with Anne Bancroft as Sullivan and Patty Duke as Keller, and then it was made into a film in 1963 with the two of them reprising their roles. We know that Helen had objections to The Miracle Worker. We don't know what precisely those objections were, uh, but it seems like she was angry about the piece and about the people in her life who let this happen without her okaying pieces of it and being allowed to be more directly involved in it. Um, and I've done a short review of this film before somewhere probably a year or two ago, but the main issue is that it narratively treats Helen like she was animalistic and non-human until the miraculous Anne Sullivan arrives to break her like a horse and turn her into a human being. And in fact, much of the language in the film itself refers to her as non-human. It also directly and indirectly promotes corporal punishment as the only way to teach a disabled child. And it plays up some of what probably genuinely happened, but to a very high degree as a sort of freak show-esque portrayal for the entertainment and thrill of an audience in a way that is deeply dehumanizing to Helen as a person. And also to some degree, it erases everything that she did later in life, which is arguably so much more important. Because now the thing that everybody knows about her is that she's the girl who learned the word water after being thrown around a lot. Not that she was like able to get a complete education and literally change the entire world. And she did write at some point somewhere about how she didn't understand why people were so obsessed with her childhood because that was the least interesting part about her. So I think she would probably be on board with that and her opinions on this uh, play and film. But we don't know her thoughts on this because she had a series of strokes around this time and thus retired from public life. Also the document that mentions her objections to some aspects of the Miracle Worker does not specify what those objections are and it seems to imply that it was sent in a former correspondence as to what those objections were but it seems like nobody has that. I couldn't track it down. I will also mention that a huge portion of the main Helen Keller archive was destroyed in 9-11. Um, and I don't know how much that's impacted the information that has been digitized about her since then. Like, I don't know if that loss was just, oh, we don't have these specific, like, the specific manuscript of this thing, but we have all the information from it um, versus like we fully lost a lot of information. That's kind of unclear to me, but I would assume that also is part of why there are gaps in information. Now, our final speech was in April 1961 about how there need to be more government funds towards special education in the country and also criticizing institutions and asylums. And then she died on June 1st, 1968 at age 87. And she now lies next to Anne and Polly in the National Cathedral. But what about the eugenics thing you might be asking? Let's talk about it. So in 1915, um, there was a case now known as the Baby Bollinger case where a baby boy was born in Chicago with physical deformities, brain damage, and partial paralysis. The doctor, Dr. Harry Hasselden, great, that's what we're gonna decide it is. He decided not to operate on the child to try to save his life and instead left the child to die and it became a huge national conversation. The doctor also later admitted that he had done this several times before, which I don't love. Um, but Helen's name was dragged into this argument because people were using her existence to argue that actually disabled people can live full lives and life is valuable and therefore what the doctor did was the wrong decision. And Helen published an article in the New Republic that sort of defended the doctor saying, it is the possibilities of happiness, intelligence, and power that give Give life its sanctity, and they are absent in the case of a poor, misshapen, paralyzed, unthinking creature. She argued that capitalists want to keep all people alive and want the poor to continue having children so that there can be more workers, which is unfair to those children who then don't get childhoods, and also because people should not be pushed to have children for which they do not have the resources available to care for, emphasizing the importance and value of birth control to protect society from future criminals and those who are undeserving of life. She also argued that no one man should ever have the ability to make the decision as to whether a disabled child should live or die, and this should instead be left up to an ethics board made up of experts who can decide what the cost-benefit analysis of a child's suffering versus their possibilities might look like, and also suggested a potential program where people with enough wealth to care for disabled children could adopt and raise them with all of the resources that they had available. Which on the surface is not fantastic, but I will also point out that such ethics boards do now kind of exist to some degree in regards to cost-benefit analysis of various kinds of medical care, um, which doesn't mean that those boards aren't deeply flawed and ableist, but it's not like this concept is super out there or unheard of or even radical. And I also think when this whole situation is brought up to talk about her as a eugenicist, it's usually framed around her defending the doctor, when I would argue that she thinks he had the right idea wrong execution. Ooh, 
bad play on words, I'm so sorry, um, because this should not have been his decision alone, which still isn't fantastic, but I do think is less bad to some degree. It also seems like she somewhat changed her mind on some of this because 13 years later, she's documented as having written to a family of um, a girl who was born with eye tumors, trying to decide what to do about that, telling them about how blindness is not the worst fate to befall a person. It's merely something that exists and can be dealt with. And thus they should choose to do the operation to save her life, um, even if it would make her blind. And it has been pointed out that this may not be precise proof that she disavowed eugenics by this point because um, she was often a lot more openly accepting of blindness than she was of other disabilities, but also she never supported the legislation and conversations around forced sterilization, and she was very vocally against the eugenicist policies of Nazi Germany, and particularly anything around the whole survival of the fittest mindset. And she worked very hard to try to get the US's eugenicist laws preventing Jewish asylum during uh, World War II to be repealed, and as far as I can tell, there doesn't seem to be really any kind of other pro-eugenicist writing from Keller uh, beyond that 1915 writing, and it all seems more focused on the ethics of life for a disabled child and overall social support in that regard, rather than like marriage bans and sterilization laws and, you know, euthanasia. And also, again, as we spoke about earlier with Alexander Graham Bell, while her earlier politics are frustrating when you look at them through a modern lens, the eugenics of the early 1900s was the prevailing science in the US, so kind of everybody agreed with various pieces of it to some degree, but that doesn't mean they agreed with all the pieces of it. And also the idea of assimilation as the best chance for disabled people to live full lives was the idea. That was the ethical idea about uh, how disabled people should live their lives at the time. So it, it does make sense that she's going to look at things this way. I will also briefly mention that the use of eugenicist as a way to try to discredit historical proponents of birth control is a very complicated and confusing legacy that I have neither the time nor expertise to really wade through here. But if you do see that word used towards a historical woman who supported birth control, maybe take some time to fact check that because it might be a more recent pro-life talking point rather than an actual factual analysis of that person's historical politics. I will also add that everything that I read about how Helen Keller is a eugenicist only quotes this one 1915 article, more specifically those two sentences that I quoted earlier, and had nothing else known about her behavior in regards to being pro-eugenics for the other 86 years of her life, beyond things that she documented that Alexander Graham Bell had told her, but she did not really remark upon. She just said, like, these are things that he said to me. Period. End of story. And I don't know if I'm just really used to reading really disgustingly ableist historical documents at this point, so my filter's broken, but I, I felt like all of the articles were like, Helen Keller published this one thing once, which proves that actually she was terrible and hated disabled people, and this is the biggest tragedy in the world, when I... I mean, it's an important piece of her legacy and impact on the world, sure, we should be talking about that. And it's not great, obviously, but the way that everybody's talking about it, I expected it to be both much worse and also much more than that. Um, and that doesn't mean that this was acceptable, but I also don't think that it's the end of the world, nor is it enough to decide to completely rewrite her legacy to make this the primary focus or like the hidden evil truth of Helen Keller or whatever. The only other thing that might have been close to eugenics that I pulled up, but I've never seen anybody try to directly frame it that way, is her work around helping to eradicate the most preventable form of blindness at the time, which even then is complicated and a nuanced discussion that disabled communities are still having today around where the line is between the ethical thing to do versus when it's eugenics and eradicating disability. And when it comes to critiquing Keller, something that I also think is really important to point out is the fact that the various pieces of the disability rights movement have looked at the mechanism of disability quite differently. During her time, disability rights were more around access to tools to assimilate, and also the different groups of disability were more separated from one another. In the 60s and 70s, the movement was very focused on community, identity, pride, and independence, as well as a sort of grouping of a lot of the disability groups together, which kind of conflicts with how she saw things. Our view of Kim Nielsen's 2004 book, The Radical Lives of Helen Keller, mentions that while Keller engaged in legislative lobbying and fundraising as part of her agreement with the AFB, she had almost nothing else to do with disabled people or the disability movement. Throughout her life, she turned down repeated requests to speak to groups and organizations on behalf of people with disabilities. She evidently did not view herself as a member of an oppressed group, but rather as an individual who had difficulties that she was able to overcome. While this furthered the story of Keller, it actually limited the effectiveness of others to politicize disability. Which I can see in both directions. Like, I understand how somebody might be frustrated that such a prominent disabled advocate would refuse to speak on behalf of disability in general, more or less, a lot of the time. But I also don't think that her turning down those requests is the only information that we have on this. Like, her focus was primarily on the experiences of the disability that were her experiences of disability in the same way that like if somebody asked me to speak at an event specifically around deafness, I would go, hey, 
maybe get a deaf person to do that. I cannot speak to that experience of marginalization. And that doesn't mean that I don't care about those issues and I don't include them in my general activism. It's just not my place and not my, you know, primary thing that I'm going to focus on because that's not my lived experience. And I also think like, if we're gonna be frank about what disability advocacy looks like right now, we are still kind of working primarily in our separate communities and then we all meet each other and we all connect with each other. And, you know, I'll, you know, text a friend uh, with a different disability to ask them a question about something that I'm talking about. And we're all communicating with each other but it still is kind of siloed in different sections and we're talking about our different things and we're thinking about the other things. We're mentioning the other things, but it's not as just like, everybody who does disability talks about all disabilities all the time and is an expert in all of them all the time because that's just not the case and that's not how that works. And I don't think that we can really criticize her for uh, not operating in that way because most of us don't operate that way today either when we have uh, a lot easier ways to connect with people today than we did back then as well. Also the criticism of her becoming less militant over time and therefore being a sort of a sellout is an interesting one because on one level yes her speeches when working with AFB are the greatest thing in the world and there was definitely a less ableist way to put things and probably be as successful but given how outspoken she was I feel like she probably pushed as hard as she could and this is just what ended up happening and to some degree she may have thought that being a little hyperbolic gets you the money to actually support people so it is worth it as an even trade-off, which I don't entirely agree with as a method of activism because you can always get what you need by not doing that um, and not throwing yourself under the bus. But if you're an ends justify the means kind of person, I do see how that could have happened, even if I don't necessarily agree with it. There's also discussion about how she didn't have many disabled friends, how she tried too hard to assimilate, how she wasn't inclusive of all disabilities and impairments, and how she saw her disability as misfortune. But again, those are all critiques in regards to what the disability rights movement looked like after she died. And let's talk about another example. Uh, Temple Grandin. She's autistic. She's still alive, so it doesn't quite, but hear me out. Um, she's autistic and a lot of her early advocacy work created the foundation for what the neurodiversity movement looks like today. And she also has not changed her politics at all since she began her advocacy work and has spoken about how she believes that science should figure out how to prevent low functioning autistics from existing, along with a lot of other ableist, classist, otherwise concerning things. It is fair to judge her politics within the current movement of what autism advocacy looks like because she's still alive and actively profiting off of being the sort of poster child for autism, despite most of the community not really supporting what she has to say. Does that mean that all of the work that she did a lot earlier in her life should not be celebrated or appreciated. Absolutely not. We would not be where we are today without her. She is a very important part of our history. And had she died 25 years ago, we would probably look at her now as we look at Helen Keller, somebody whose ideas were advanced for the time in which she lived, but now we've moved beyond that. And that doesn't mean that she was necessarily wrong back then. We've just moved on. I mean, it does now because she's alive and still talking about these things via a huge platform, but you know what I mean, right? I did see one article that briefly mentioned how Keller specifically wasn't actually that radical because she was still a white person with a lot of white privilege. And I think that is true. And I very much agree with that. I would also argue though, um, that she did know how to wield that privilege to some degree to get eyes in the right places and at least start conversations. Like, yes, the fact that arguably one of the most famous disabled people in the world is a white person who grew up on a plantation isn't the greatest thing. And could she have done more for race politics? Probably. I would agree with that. But I do feel like this is a situation where we can just kind of factor that in as a part of our information about her and why we shouldn't say, wow, she's perfect and leave it at that, which is kind of what things were doing beforehand. Because we also should be talking about the fact that like Roger O'Kelly was the first black deafblind person to get a law degree in 1912, getting his degree four years after Helen. That's just as important as Helen Keller's existence. Also, uh, from a disability politics perspective, I think to some degree she was ahead of her time, particularly around her more Marxist views of what disability is, how all oppression is disabling, how yes, impairment is disability, but also so are other things, and the tying together of all marginalized groups as marginalized groups and disabled communities. Um, she also once wrote about how disability is not the direct cause of unemployment, but it is involved because the capitalistic system requires a lot of idle men in order to function. And a lot of things that she said around the politics of disability, while not using the precise language we use in these discussions today, is very similar in meaning and intent, particularly in walking that nuanced line that is what we today call the biopsychosocial model of disability. When I don't know, 10 to 15 years ago, the prevailing model of discussion was around advancing the purely social model disability, which is the model against which a lot of the critiques of Helen Keller have come from because she was never firmly in the social model. But also, we aren't today either, but we tried to be for a bit. And that's just been a change in how we talk about disability rights. And yes, she did have a tendency to sort of throw intellectually and mentally disabled people under the proverbial bus sometimes. Like she would defend herself and her right to exist by pointing out how her intelligence saved her and all of that. But that change in language around mental disability in particular really didn't start culturally until after she died or like the very end of her life. And I would argue is one of the newest pieces of the disability rights movement and something that is a huge conversation even right now. So while in going through her commentary on things that really 
really pops out to a modern disability scholar, especially one who focuses on madness. It's kind of hard for me to be frustrated at her for doing that, given the prevailing ideas around mental disability that existed at the time. And at the very least, she was very anti-institution, which I think is as radical in regards to mental disability as we were kind of gonna get from that era. I've been thinking a lot lately about um, imperfect historical figures and about how there's this emphasis in society right now to point out the flaws in people that were glorified in our high school textbooks, which I think is important. Like, yes, this dude did a cool thing, but also he owned slaves and people at the time definitely knew that slavery was wrong. Like, that's a great conversation. We should be having that. But I also think sometimes we go so far in that direction that instead of using that to think more critically about people and also more generally to humanize them, we use it to decide that actually they sucked and we shouldn't be glorifying them or even talking about them at all. And there's also like a huge difference between somebody being a slave owner when there were tons of abolitionists and people knew better versus somebody, you know, having a specific opinion on a political issue where the framework for the current political opinion on that issue did not quite exist yet. And I don't think that's necessarily helpful or productive because those conversations often happen while ignoring the social context of the time in which those things took place. Or like in Helen's case, they point to a very specific moment in that person's life and decide that defines everything that they did and everything that they stood for. When for me, the historical figures that I like the most are the ones who have messed up and who have changed their minds, who are ones who you can see how they have set values and how the expression of those values changes over time as they learn more things and meet more people. I also love seeing historical figures who have their own flaws and insecurities in a way that humanizes them and makes them feel real. Like with Helen, for example, some people critique the fact that her writing has a lot of internalized ableism in it, particularly around being a burden and always being dependent upon other people. Like in her book, uh, Midstream, My Later Life, where she talks about marriage, she says, I feel less inclined than ever to embark upon the great adventure. I have fully made up my mind that a man and a woman must be equally equipped to weather successfully the vicissitudes of life. It would be a severe handicap to any man to saddle upon him the dead weight of my infirmities. I know I have nothing to give a man that would make up for such an unnatural burden. And do I think today we should be publishing memoirs? memoirs that are full of completely uninterrogated internalized ableism now that we have the language for that? Probably not. Maybe not my favorite thing in the world because that can cause real harm both for disabled people thinking that's a healthy and normal way to think about oneself in a way that further cements self-hatred and internalized ableism. And also for the non-disabled who are reading those things and going, oh, all disabled people feel this way. They hate themselves. And that's correct because disability is a curse and makes your life hell. But I don't think that means we should ignore those stories either. Just consume them more thoughtfully preferably with some commentary so we can all unlearn those biases. Because we can't blame Helen for living life in a world that was actively hostile towards her and a world that required several hoops of accommodation to jump through in order to be able to interact with it in a way that's accessible to her. She had been directly told by many people in her life that she could not and should not marry and that assimilation was the only way she could have happiness. So of course she is going to believe that about herself. I mean, I still feel like a burden sometimes and like I don't deserve help and support even though my access needs are pretty much non-existent at this point. And that's as somebody who's spends most of their time around disabled people where we're all trying to unpack all of that at the same time. So I cannot imagine what it must have felt like for her. And also that language for internalized ableism did not really exist back then to even help start to unpack that. Is it frustrating that she often wrote about her disabilities as a great misfortune? Absolutely. But also, again, when everybody around you is telling you that it is, you're going to think that way. And when something has, just factually, made your life kind of difficult in some direction, you're going to think that way, unless you have a support system to help you unlearn that, which she very much did not to some degree. And I think part of people's issues with Helen Keller in particular is not the specific things that she said, but the fact that she is the only disabled person that most people can name. The fact that she's the only disabled historical figure that anybody ever learns about in their history classes. And also what she has come to represent as a historical figure. She is framed in societal memory as this saintly, perfect, beautiful person who overcame disability because she worked hard enough to conform to able norms and that's how she gained acceptance. She represents what it means to be human, specifying in media that the uneducated version of her is animalistic and terrifying and she only becomes human when she conforms. She's also only portrayed in society as a child, meaning that anybody who sees photos of adult her smiling at various events and whatnot automatically infantilizes her and thus infantilizes other disabled people, which causes real harm. Many deafblind people also talk about how they sort of live life in her shadow for better or for worse and are constantly being compared to her. And I don't think any of this is an accident. This version of her is the palatable one. It's the one that fits within the metrics of the paternalistic American dream version of disability that people are comfortable with and causes great harm to actually disabled people. And it's also deliberate from a marketing perspective. Ivy Green, her home Homestead is very careful about its politics and hiding a lot of pieces of Helen Keller's legacy because that would make a lot of people in Alabama, where it is, not want to support them as much. And instead they just perform the miracle worker on weekends over the summer. I mean, even the statue of her in the Capitol building is of a little girl at the water pump because 
we're not going to put a statue of a known socialist in the middle of the Capitol building. Her legacy has been sanitized because that's what makes people more comfortable. There's nothing surprising to me about the fact that most of the modern conspiracy theories about Helen Keller being fake or sort of puppet or anything else are directly connected to right-wing conspiracy theories because people don't want to believe that disabled people are capable of doing the things that she did. For me, I sort of went into this with the view of Keller that I thought was the more recent one, which is the, oh, she was a eugenicist, so, you know. And at the end of all this, I feel like that attempt to update our view of who she was actually diminishes her and flattens her just as much as the water pump view does. And while I think that's a valid critique, it's also not the thing we should be adding to the thing that everybody knew about her beforehand, which was virtually nothing, because that causes a lot more harm in a very different direction. She was a very radical person. She wasn't going to always be perfect, especially given the times in which she was working as a radical person. But how cool is it that she did so many of the things that she did and was so in line with our politics of today in so many directions? And this is kind of the only thing that people point to and go, hmm, I don't know how I feel about that. And also how much she was able to accomplish in her very long lifetime. Like, frankly, for me, just seeing a disabled person involved in so much of this to begin with historically makes my heart hurt in a good way. I I pulled up an image of her um, at a Suffs march that I'll, I'll put above and I just, I simply burst into tears seeing that. The fact that I disagreed with some of her politics, the fact that I saw how her politics changed over time, those are things that made me acutely aware that this person was an actual living, breathing, real human in history rather than this mythical one-dimensional image in a textbook I was always taught that she was. and seeing how her legacy has been deliberately obscured for the purposes of marketing and of selling a more palatable story about disability and about the American dream has made me wonder about every other historical figure that I thought that I knew about. Because who were they really? How was history chosen to represent them to deliberately ignore the mess of who they were? I mean, we can comb through this with Helen because she wrote so much, but what about other people who weren't writing as much? That's the history that I want. Those are the kind of role models that I want to learn from and carry the legacy of. And I think there's so much pressure to be perfect all the time, especially right now where everybody's documenting everything and therefore we sort of fear over messing up or changing or disagreeing with our former selves and there's just something comforting to me about seeing famous people in history struggle with that same thing and see how they grew and changed over time based on the people they were around and the experiences that they had. It's just... It's really cool. And I, I really enjoyed making this video and learning all of these things and thinking about how we so readily criticize historical figures and get frustrated when our role models aren't perfect. I've been talking a lot lately with other academics about the musical Suffs that's on Broadway right now. And I don't think I've talked about this channel before, um, but I, I should be. Uh, go see it if you're local. It's fantastic. I truly cannot recommend it enough. Um, about how that show is the rare narrative that neither glorifies nor condemns its characters, who were all very real historical figures, and instead just hands them to you as deeply complicated, deeply flawed people and lets you decide what you want to think about them. And I think we're so used to getting clear good guys and clear bad guys in media that we try to look at the regular world as good guys and bad guys and we struggle to hold all these pieces of nuance at once unless we really know somebody really well. And I think there's something intrinsically powerful and calming about reminding yourself to look at people as just people with a lot of good and a lot of bad. Um, but anyway, I'm just, I'm musing. Let me wrap this one up. If you want to learn more about Helen Keller, I have linked all my sources below for you. You should check them out. While you're down there, um, you can hit any of the buttons you want, particularly the like and subscribe ones. I also have a link to my Patreon somewhere down there if you want early access to stuff. And let me know what you think about all these things, what you learned about Helen Keller in your school if you ever learned about her, because I don't think that I actually did. Um, let me know in the comments below. And as always, thank you for listening. Thank you for learning. Remember, it's never too late to start over and critical thinking is really sexy. I look forward to seeing you, my dear, in the next one.